And we are live uh, for another week of Zohar. I'd like to thank the growing list of sponsors to this class. If I leave your name out, please correct me or forgive me, uh, but that would be uh, Lisa Heath, Joe Souza, Michael Goldenberg, Andy Pesson, Rachel Friedberg, maybe leaving someone out, but um, if you have, and what? Um, so thank you to all those people who have made donations in honor of this class. Uh, now the most donated to class in Congregation Beth Shalom's uh, history, likely besides Andy Pesson's great class of last summer. So um, uh, thank you for getting us on the wall of fame and uh, for your support. If anyone else would like to donate, there's never any pressure, but synagogues are dying. So uh, on that note, uh, please feel free to go to bethshalom-ri.org. And if you like, make a contribution of any amount from one cent to $1 million and uh, mention it's for this class. And you'll get your name mentioned at the beginning of next class, but you'll get your name mentioned in class for a great insight. So you don't need to give money to have your name mentioned. It's not about the money, it's about the study. Uh, that's the Ikar. And with that, we go. Am I getting better at the fundraising thing, anyone? So with that, we'll go to... I was just going to say, you're a natural fundraiser. Oh, well, th you're a professional fundraiser, actually. So that means a lot. Give me tips when we're off the call. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and thank you so much for that. So we were discussing the teaching of the letters last week. And in particular, this interesting... Um, you know, all the letters come, as you may recall, and are auditioning to be the first letter. And we had discussed a little bit the notion of letters doing this just in a meta sense what that means. And then we gotten into the specific letters. And so the letter tough had come. So I wanted to just jump in a little bit to the, that teaching tough is rejected. At first, it's the last letter of amount of truth, then it's rejected because it's the mark in the old script, which prompted a debate on the Facebook live stream about this, about whether the Hebrew term Assyrian script, Ketav Ashuri, is really Assyrian script or not. And people started saying the rabbis had the wrong name for the Assyrian script, and it devolved into this Facebook debate, which was interesting. All that aside, uh, Joe Suze is the expert on that. We rejected Tuff because of its mark on the righteous who, who die. Um, and we talked about the righteous dying and, and that being um, a source of truth, but also in some way limited, the limitations of truth. I thought it would be worthwhile to look at that Talmud piece um, in some, just if you want. You could just accept the teaching, but I was getting the unspoken sense that, what is this vague Talmud we're talking about? Like, can we see this Talmud? I don't know, I felt that from two or three eyes, sets of eyes. So I thought maybe, maybe we'd just look at that. It's actually, a, a, more complicated than that, as fate would have it. Um, so now you should be seeing um, a split screen. On the one hand, on the left side is the actual statement from Ezekiel that prompted this. Vayomer Hashem Elav, and God said to him, Avor betoch ha'ir, this is Ezekiel, the prophet, Pass through the city, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, v'hit vita tava mitzchot anashim, hanenachim v'anenachim. Pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who groan, moan, and groan. I'll call it to'evot hana'asot betocha, because of all of the abominations that are committed within it. So these people who are groaning, who are grumbling about the sinners, um, maybe you know some of them, are the righteous. The righteous are here in the posture. So already it struck me that the righteous are portrayed in a particular way here, groaning because of the sinners, groaning and moaning and not doing anything. In other words, there's, there's some um, sense in the verse that they're kvetching, they're complaining, they wish more was done, but yet they're not doing it. Uh, I don't know if that's explicit in the text, but that's, you could see where the Talmud wants to read that in. Um, whether that's shot, plain meaning, or it's just the Talmud has its point, either way. Um, so I'm just going to move the faces. There's actually a long teaching. <sighs> we'll go through it. 
Do you want to start at the beginning or at the relevant part? Maybe the relevant part. This is from the Talmud in Shabbat, 55a. Meolam lo yatsta mida tova mi pia kadosh barahu, the chazarba la ra chutz mita varze. God never said, so there's this idea that appears repeatedly in the Talmud in Brachot, also in Shabbat, several times, that when God promises something good, he always does it. When God promises something bad, like I'm going to burn you all and send you to hell, he could relent from that idea, and it's not in any way a sign of God's weakness, um, because after all, God forgives. <laughs> it's just a sign that the people repented, like in Nineveh. So God not doing, welcome Deb, we're just, um, uh, we're just discussing uh, the Talmud that relates to the teaching of last week. So there's this idea in the Talmud that God always fulfills good promises, though he could change his mind on punishment. And that's the idea quoted here, that God never decreed anything good that he later didn't do. Like he said, I'm going to do this nice thing and I'm not, and then okay. changed his mind except for this thing. God said, you know, pass through the city of Jerusalem. Mark a top on the foreheads of all these righteous people who are grumbling, groaning, and moaning about the sinners and the abominations that are committed within it. So here you get um, God, a dialogue between God and the angel Gabriel. You imagine the heavenly court and how this conversation goes. Go, Gabriel, and put a tuff on the heads of all of these, a, a tuff of ink on the heads of the righteous, um, so that the, the, um, you know, the damager angel, the, the doom messenger, not wound them. And on the heads of the evil people, not a tuff of ink, but a tuff of blood, so that that will be the sign that they should die. So the Talmudic imagination actually has everyone getting a tuff. It's just a question, is yours ink or is yours blood? If you're evil, it's blood. Um, interesting, it's like the reverse of the Passover story, where the blood mm. acts as a... Uh, uh, what's the word? Protection, yeah. Protection. That? There's that word, um, you know what I'm talking about, the formal word for um, a ritual right. that offers spiritual right. protection. Um, can't think of it offhand. I'm thinking but, pro something. Right. Uh, um, if anyone knows, there's a formal academic word for this thing. So in the Passover story, the blood is protective. Here, the blood is a sign that you're going to have blood. Um, it's the opposite. So the attribute of justice speaks up and says in this heavenly drama, master of the universe, what's the difference between the righteous and the wicked? These are entirely righteous and these are entirely wicked. What do you mean? So the attribute of justice says, yeah, but they should have, if these people were so righteous, they should have rebuked the other people, not just moaned and groaned about it. Um, and, and it could be that the moaning and groaning is amongst themselves, right? which is the nature of righteous complaints about wicked people. Um, I'm thinking of many times in my life where I've been in a gathering of people who assume that everyone in that group has um, a, a homogenous worldview and often I either don't, or certainly know people who don't. <laughs> right? Like you either don't share the view entirely, or at least you can see both sides, or I have friends you respect that feel otherwise. But you, you pretend for the moment, like a third column or a spy, that you agree with everyone. And and so this is a normal thing that people complain about other people amongst seemingly like-minded people. So okay, um, so they didn't rebuke them. So it goes on. Amr la. So it's not done. So God says to that attribute, yeah, but if they, um, if they would have rebuked, who says maybe they knew that it wasn't going to be accepted. And there is this idea which is um, behind that in the Talmud several other times, which is that if you could rebuke someone, but you know they're not going to take it from you, 
that it's better not to, because it's better that people should sin and not be warned than that they should be warned in sin, because that multiplies the sin. Now, not only are they sinning, they're, they're ignoring the people that told them so. So it's worse to warn people who won't. Like, for example, right now the Aruv is down. National Grid called the synagogue this morning and said, by accident during construction, we, we destroyed the Aruv and the, the edifice that allows carrying on Shabbat according to strict Jewish law. Um, so of course we call, we thank them, thank you for calling us and letting us know about your actions. And so now we're, can we fix it? So, so interestingly, there's a you know, big debate in halacha in Jewish law. If the Eruv is in fact not fixed, should we send out an email to tell people because after all people should know? Or, hey, I have a feeling that most people may still carry outside on Shabbat. Could be, I bet. So I, I don't know, but I know there are people that might not care if I told them otherwise. And so maybe we shouldn't say anything because then not only would people be carrying, they'd be warned in carrying. So there's this idea, better to be shogagim, to, to be sort of unwarned sinners. Okay. Um, this idea, by the way, features prominently in the opening chapters of Shnei Luchot Abrit of Isaiah Levi Horowitz's magnum opus. The first long treatise is on rebuke, specifically this and other episodes about how do you know if it's a good idea or not. Amar la, galoi viadua lefanai she'im milchut mehem lo yekabdu mehem. So, um, where was I here? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, so Amr Levanav, Ribbonu Sholam, Im Levanach Galoi, Lahem Mi Galoi. So the attribute of justice, who's looking to prosecute the people here, says, "Yeah, you know that they won't accept it, but who told them?" In other words, those righteous people didn't know. They have no idea. They should have erred on the side of rebuking. This is two verses later in Ezekiel. So he quotes the next couple of verses to to justify the end of the story. So it quotes this verse, slay utterly old and young, both maid and little children, is a horrible verse, and women, but come not near any man upon whom the mark is the mark, the tough. Don't kill the, t- kill everyone, women, children, elderly, young. Sounds like some people in their political comments now. Open the economy, kill the, kill the people. But begin at my sanctuary. Um, so this is a weird, what do you mean begin at my sanctuary? Like start the murder of the wicked in the apocalypse? What, in the zip code of the old city of Jerusalem? Like start there and work out and get to the Golan Heights later? Like what's the, what's the, you know, and can't the angel of death do this simultaneously or, you know, mm-hmm. in one fell swoop or does it happen through, how does this happen? So because of this sort of confusing thing, and then it's written and, 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 um, and they began with the elderly men that were before the house. So Tani Rav Yosef, don't read my sanctuary, Ella Mikudashai, those who are sanctified to me, a bizarre read, right? Don't, don't begin at the temple. <laughs> begin with the, the begin your slaughter of the wicked with the righteous. That's the reread. Elubene Adam. So who are they? These are people. This is where the teaching comes into our Zohar. These are the people that observe the whole Torah from Aleph, the beginning of the alphabet, to top the end. And so, and behold, uh, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lies toward the north, and every man with his weapon of destruction in his hand. And one man among them was clothed in linen with a writer's inkwell by his side, and they went and stood beside the bronze altar. Uh, it, this goes on, actually. But, um, um, I think you actually have gotten what you need for the Zohar. Uh, this goes on for a while with details of the story. But, um, and it's interesting. And if folks want to see the continued dis- uh, discussion about tough and like, why the letter tough, which is the next Talmud's question. Like why tough, which is different than the Zohar's and it has to do with 
Tachia, Liv, Tamuta, you see the Talmud, Shabbat 55a, but um, that's what we've got. So, given all of that, are you back in the Zohar now? You see the Zohar now, right? Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay, we're getting better at this technology stuff each week. So, um, just so you understand, the Zohar in saying it's short comments, um, you know, to tough. You are destined to be marked on the foreheads of the faithful who fulfilled the Torah from Aleph to Tav. You see the resonance of the Talmud sort of being alluded to here. And by your mark, they will die. So this is the Mikudashai, Altikrain, Mikudashai, Mikudashai, Mikdashai, Ela Mikudashai. Don't read my temple, read my holy ones. Okay. So the thing I wanted to open it up to is the possibility of bigger ethical teaching here about truth, which is, I think, something really interesting. Um, the sense here is that truth wasn't good because people being right caused them to complain in this Talmudic episode of a take on Ezekiel about the wicked people, but not to rebuke them, which they might not have accepted, but they didn't know that. <laughs> so, so there's an interesting thing, because in truth, the people they would have rebuked wouldn't have accepted the rebuke anyway in the story. But, but the response of the prosecutor is, yeah, but they didn't know that. So um, there's a sense in which truth is being cast against itself. Like in truth, they didn't really do anything differently. Nothing would have happened had they done anything differently. But because, but there's also something about truth which caused them not to care about other people and maybe even to judge them negatively, to groan and moan about them. So um, uh, reactions to that uh, sense of being being right, um, like is being right not good or is it just not the start of the Torah because it can be fraught, right? Like, is this a critique of truth <laughs> from like a post, are, are we critiquing the idea of truth here is like not good? Or are we just saying truth is complicated and so you don't begin the letter with a letter related to truth because <laughs> truth is there's objectivity and there's subjectivity and there's being right and there's doing right and, uh, or is this all speculative? <laughs> No comments. Okay, okay. we'll leave okay, it at that, but I open for you the possibility that the Zohar is playing with these ideas and it's um, positing tough as the seal of God, of truth, and then rejecting it as, by quoting this story, among many other stories it could have quoted about truth, right? That truth is all over the Talmud. And so to choose this one is a thing. Um, let me just find the Hebrew text again. I, I, maybe I'll just, just venture one comment because it reminds me of a, another story from, because um, we were just doing a uh, shir on, on Talmud Shabbat where it's the story of Rabbi um, um, uh, Shemot Bar Chai and, uh, mm-hmm. and kind of that idea, and also which was like by Omer is, is celebrated as kind of his yort site. Um, <laughs> And the idea, the, the story of when Rabbi Shimon and his son, Rabbi Elazar, go into the cave for 12 months to avoid the Romans and they come out. And when they come out, they're like so full of like emes that, and truth and kind of enlightenment that they look on these farm workers who are, are toiling in labor rather than doing Torah mitzvot and they instantly kill them all. And, uh, and uh, the heavenly voice tells them to go back into the cave to... To, because they've destroyed the work of creation and then they come back out and they have this kind of second revelation that uh, everything that it's not just Emmett, everything has its like value. And, uh, and so maybe, maybe there's something in that story. I think that was uh, from 30, sorry, I have, I, I have it in the sheer that's like open on my computer. It's from. Yeah. Shabbat. It's Lamed Gimel 33. Yeah. yeah so, 33. So, yeah. So thank you. Yeah. So I mean, it's right. So there is this interesting way in which, I don't want to bash truth that's like in vogue these days, but there is an interesting way in which um, truth, righteousness can lead to self-righteousness or judgmentalism in a religious context. And at least the mystics of the Zohar are probably skeptical of this a little bit. Um, And maybe they're skeptical of those strands within the more mainstream versions of religion uh, that they feel I'm reimagining. 
uh, make more difficult their mystical speculation and adventures, which are sort of non-traditional in a sense. Um, Can I weigh in with a thought? My, yeah. my dog has been barking a lot, so I apologize in advance. Um, but, uh, you know, there is the, also the basic premise, following up on Joe's point, that uh, we can't handle the truth, right? Which is, I mean, <laughs> Hashem is called the truth, and we're told no one, can, you know, mo no one can see me and live. So the full, unadulterated truth is very connected to human death in some way, um, which means the truth that we have to live with in order to live has to be modified or restrained in some way to make it manageable to us. And I'm sorry about the dog. No, no, no. The Zohar has a whole theology of dogs. We'll get there. So um, <laughs> they're actually the souls of people who didn't do well in the prior incarnation. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, <laughs> barking, <laughs> they hear the teachings. So. Right. Okay. Right. So there's this idea, right, about the compromises we make in a big way, just to be able to bear our lives, or, or metaphysically, like the limits of the human mind. But, but even just what you're saying, yeah, truth. So <laughs> this idea, what's the truth of creation, and saying no, yeah. So I'm also thinking about the intention behind the telling of the truth, and it's, and I remember in. Um, our Musar class, we were talking about humility. Mm. Um, and I, I'm just thinking about like, what is your intention behind telling the truth? What are you trying to impart or inflict on the person that you're, so like, that's a lousy way to start the Torah and the story of the creation of the world is, um, you know, with a potentially negative intention um, or, or, Mm. I don't know. Intention's the only word I can think of, but I think there's a better word than that. Yeah. Maybe I'll even add, I don't know if I'm, it's a reflection on your point, which is that the Zohar is interested in mystical union and truth, as we've seen of like knowing is actually sort of a test of humility, right? Because when the more you know, the more you think of yourself or might. And Right, knowledge becomes a source of power or ego or individual identity in some basic way. And, and identification with thoughts becomes an idea. Um, and to that extent, it renders difficult the idea of mystical union, of letting go, of not knowing, of, <laughs> right, of, of, of connecting with others. Because if the more we know, we find reason to frequently judge others, it becomes harder to enter mystical union with others if we have negative thoughts about them. So um, it, it could be that it's also a comment about Emet being like Shimon Bar Yochai, or the, like an opposition to you, the humility necessary for the sort of mystical union the Zohar is interested in cultivating, or that is the purpose or the telos of creation, uh, in a sense, right? This idea that creation only exists for these sort of unifications um, for that end. I don't know, just, I don't know if that's inherent in this text, but it could be. <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing a, a, a subtle swipe at straight observance because the internet, uh, you know, often um, uh, drushed as Aleph Atav um, is kind of, put back to back to those who fulfill the Torah, Aleph Ad Taf, and neither of those are the ideal. So I think you're right that there's some swipe at truth, but maybe some swipe at, I don't know, straight plain observance without, you know, the other mystical intentions behind it. Right, and you know, and, and it could have even been self cognizant of the debate going on of people laying the claim at the mystics look we have the mitzvot and you've superimposed your mystical system onto this whole this whole layer of meaning onto these mitzvot in ways that at times change them at times transform them and certainly change the import of what's going on and who says that you know this is a and and they might be responding back well your plain observance isn't the main thing you know you've lost the the connection that happens. And famously, the Zohar even reinterprets mitzvot from the language of tzavta, from connection rather than command. Um, so they reinterpret it using an Aramaic root. And so mitzvah, which means commands, they reinterpret as, as um, the Zohar actually describes them as in, in Yitro. The Zohar on Parshat Yitro says there's 613 
um, at scene. I, uh, suggestions <laughs> for how you can connect to God. It even goes so far, and suggestion is, is a very loose language for a commandment. A suggestion, you know, is not usually what rabbis, there are 630 suggestions for spiritual growth in the Torah. No, no. there are 630 commandments that you must do or you'll get stoned, die, etc. right? So, uh, so the Zohar does regularly seem to take these sort of um, swipes at that kind of observance. Um, um, they were also leaving out on Elisa's comment about Musar. They, they leave out the Talmudic piece, I think, about the reason that the, uh, the good guys are going to get killed is because they were unethical. They didn't rebuke. That piece is left out of this Zohar piece. So they also seem to I don't know, ignore, or they're not so interested in the ethical critique of observance, um, but may have another one because they don't, they leave that piece out. Right, it, right, it's interesting. They, they don't now enter into when should you rebuke someone. You know, the Zohar could go on a tangent about rebuke now uh, and do laws of rebuke, but it doesn't. So the question is whether they're incorporating that by reference to the Talmud and just not quoting the whole story because it's kind of a long story, or whether they intentionally are quoting, you know, the part about the observance, but leaving out, you know, that they could have rebuked and didn't. Because I think it's clearly the same story they must be referencing. I mean, you know, it's got to be, and that's an earlier tradition. Um, All right, I think we'll go to Shin. There's probably infinite things we could do about this teach. I love this, just this letter tough, but there are so many other letters of the alphabet. So, uh, but if you have more about tough, say so. Alat at Shin Kamei, I think this is related to. So then Shin came, I'll read it in Hebrew. Amra Kamei, Ribon Almin, Nicha Kamach Lemivri Bi Alma, Devi et Kri Shemach Shaddai, Bialt Lemivri Alma Bishma Kadisha, Amar La, Yaut Ant, Al Sitra Bisha Inunu Beginlet Kaima Natle at Shin Bigavayu Bahave Kasher Kevan de Hamat Hachi Nafkat Mikame. So, in case you didn't follow that, yes, actually, this teaching is a little easier in the Aramaic than many of the Zohar's teachings, but letter Shin came before him and said, She said, Master of the worlds, may it please you to create the world by me, for by me you are named. Shaddai, which is a name of God, which at least according to a classic Hebrew midrashic thing means Amar la Olam died. God said to the world enough. God sort of restrained the creation. I think about this in terms of like setting forces of gravity, norm, weak force, strong force. I don't know, but you can think of it however you want. God sort of put a boundary on the world. I always think about things in terms of physics, but and it is fitting to create the world by a holy name. Look, I'm a name of God, but not just a name of God, a name that is classically associated with the creation of the world. I said to the world enough. I put the boundaries to what is and isn't created. And the whole creation story is about boundaries of light and dark, sea and dry land, uh, different species, etc. He replied, you are seemly, you are good, and you are true. Query, is this teaching building on the tough, the emet, the truth, and sort of, is there a letter emanation teaching going on here that isn't just sequential, but emanative? It's like, <laughs> do the rejected letters emanate one out of the next in some form of improvement or not? I don't, I don't know, that may be a stretch, but, um, but true is mentioned as one of the adjectives of Shin, which wouldn't strike me as you'd have to say kishot, true. But since letters of deceit take you as their accomplice, I do not wish to create the world by you. For a lie cannot exist unless kuf resh take you. So we're still working with truth, mind you, right? So what happens? Shin is Shaddai, but Shin is also the first letter in the word sheker, lie. 
and kuf resh sequentially are behind it, right? So we're dealing with this, this notion that, well, you know, you um, have a relationship with falsehood that is uncomfortable. Whoever wants to tell a lie, so here we do get an ethical piece. Whoever wants to tell a lie will first lay a foundation of truth and then construct the lie, right? Everyone knows you want to tell a good lie. You base part of it in something true so that people can say, well, this part checked out. Um, for Shin is a letter of truth, a true letter of the patriarchs who were united in it. What do we mean, mean by united in it? So Shin here represents, there are three strands to the Shin, although the Shin on the Tefillin, one side has three and one has four, which is interesting to think about. There, it's a Shin written on the box of the head of Tefillin classically, and on one side of the box, the Shin has three legs, but on the other side, it's a four-legged Shin, which is a tradition, traditionally assumed to be from Moses. In any event, so the Shin is a letter of truth, a letter of the patriarchs who were united in it. And here, the patriarchs are not necessarily Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov per se, but are their associated spherot emanations of uh, Chesed, Gevura, and Tiferet, just to see that on the chart. When you think about patriarchs in the Zohar, you're always thinking about Chesed, Avraham, and his loving kindness and reaching out to strangers and trying to fight for Sodom to be saved. This is always Avraham. Um, in fact, on Matt's chart, it's labeled Abraham. And uh, Gevura, uh, an inwardness, an interiority, and a restraint is always Isaac, who didn't complain when he probably understood that his father was about to sacrifice him. Um, and Tiferet, uh, a balance uh, that is beautiful between sort of outwardness and inwardness, loving kindness and strength, um, bringing in and pushing away, is Jacob. Uh, here, Jacob, also sometimes Moses. So, um, so this is Shin. These are three letters, sort of three legs of the Shin are meant to refer to this triangle um, of relationship between them in a certain way. Um, okay. And Kuf Reish are letters that appear on the, in the, the evil side. So, um, <laughs> there's this notion in the Zohar that um, every good thing can, without balance, become a bad thing. And so sometimes teachers of Jewish mysticism will teach a sphira and it's evil twin. <laughs> but, and sometimes in the Zohar, the Sfirot will actually become the demonic embodiment of their negative alter ego. <laughs> like they'll transform into these negative forces, um, which is to say that balance is crucial uh, to it. And without balance, any piece of this can become bad. And I think that's something we know in life, right? Which is that you can be kind and your kindness can smother other people um, if it's not balanced with other attributes and for any of them. Um, and so it's really an act of balancing and integration. So, so here, the fact that Shin, that the patriarchs can become a source of deceit is like, it's not unlike what we said about truth before, that truth can become self-righteousness or at least could there lead not to rebuke or could be short-sighted. Here is that the patriarchs, you know, any of these things, um, these could, could be misused. Chesed um, Gvura Tiferet. There, you know, it's, uh, they're also the first letters of lies. Query, I think there's um, a Christian Islamic polemic going on here, but I, I don't, I couldn't find it in anything. I looked at academic stuff and classic stuff, but it, it strikes me that maybe they were saying, and I, because it's in Spain and, you know, you're near both worlds, maybe they were saying, but someone can tell me this is a crazy idea, and I have no justification for it. It's just a feeling I got when I read it that they were feeling like, well, the Christians took the sort of revelation of Moshe and the same patriarchs, and they did a different thing with it. And the Muslims, on the other hand, even took Abraham as the founder of their religion and did a different thing with it. And so when we're talking about misappropriating the patriarchs, um, you could just discuss that spiritually and demonically. But I, I can't imagine that when they talk about misappropriating the patriarchs, 
that it's not far from the minds of a writer in what 13th century Spain, Christianity or Islam uh, uh, as such a thing, and that calling them false but rooted in some truth is a way of relating to them spiritually as well. Um, so I don't know. If idea, but I don't know how it applies here because what we're learning here is that because Shin is connected with Kof and Reish, that Shin loses the privilege of being the first. Let, it reflects badly on Shin, but I don't think you'd want to follow that analogy and say that there's a problem with Judaism because it somehow gave birth to, you know, corrupted Christianity and Islam. So well, there's a limit unless to the, the mystics are, you know, so it depends. If we're critiquing observance in the first, uh, now I'm wondering, is the teaching of the letters a secret coded critique of religion as they saw it? A Jewish religion is this. And maybe they're saying, you know, pure observance isn't good enough. And why isn't good enough? Because it gets corrupted without the proper sort of mystical uh, in inward intentions. You know, you lose that to other religions, which sees on your weaknesses because you didn't have a fully balanced religion and you were missing things. So it led people to take it in other directions. Um, I don't know. Rav Cook says something like that. Um, uh, and so I don't... Well, I'm wondering if what's behind this that wasn't in the original Midrash that it's based on, which is this idea of connection. In other words, it's, it's because the Kuf is related to Shin and Resh that it gets um, it's, its bad tone to it. Um, that's, that's the Zohar's innovation on this little midrash. Um, the original midrash just talks about, oh, Sheker, that was no good, so you're out, Shin. But here mm -hmm. it's about interrelationships that um, Rabbi Dollinger, you pointed out a number of times, the whole spherotic system is all about how things are interconnected. Um, so even the bad side stuff is bad because of its connections, not because of itself in some way. Is it, I don't know if I'm expressing this right, but there's- Yeah, no. Right, in other words, right, and, and bad isn't as bad. So, so there's an interesting thing that happens if I'm understanding what Rabbi Confer is saying, which is that in this sense, Judaism becomes a little bit less good in that it's you know, easily, it's flawed in some sense and therefore rightly corrupted. And the corruptions are also only corruptions to the extent that they seize upon initial weaknesses that ought to have been fixed. And so the corruptions are less corrupt and the original thing is less good. And it's the interrelationship between all of it that sort of becomes a problem. Um, and the Zohar doubles down on this one. It says in order to survive, they entangle the letter Shin, forming a Kesher, the same letters. They're, now we're playing with this, right? It, and, and this may be what you're alluding to in part, that the word Sheker, lie, with the letters you arrange becomes Kesher, connection, or as they understand it here, a conspiracy. <laughs> so, right, we deepen the idea of a, 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 um, an ill-suited ill connection to become a, a conspiracy. There's a conspiracy between the letters here. Um, um, seeing this, she left his presence. <laughs> well, maybe we should say no individual letter is good or bad in itself because each letter can be conjoined with other letters to make good things or bad things. And so the goodness and badness comes in the connections and somehow not in the intrinsic letters. And this works well with the Sefer Yitzhira's notion that the letters are representative in some basic sense of the connections between the spherot, that each letter represents some part of a pathway from one sphere to another, or the letters are the way we communicate, which are fundamentally connections, right? And so here, you know, we're talking about a letter and letters are connections and you're the letter that represents conspiratorial connections, connections for evil. So, I don't know, there's... I, I like the way Andy expressed it. So I think the theology of the Zohar is about interconnectedness. That's what's behind all this. The interconnectedness of everything. It's oneness by being interconnected, flowing into each other. And the evil side that they feel is very real, has a reality to it, is also bad because of its interconnectedness. And I guess for us, because Rabbi Dollinger, you're trying to bring this to our spirituality, what, 
what would it mean to have a this theology of Oz of everything's value is about how it's interconnected. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. But. Well, and, and now I'll just get, yeah, that's a beautiful, I love that question. Um, I'm thinking of my dear teacher, Rabbi Jonathan Slater, who always asks the questions, so now what? <laughs> right. and, which is a useful question with studying mystical texts to bring it like what are we taking from this so I think you asked the so now like the question you should be asking in that regard and you might look at it differently I, I would say in response but we'll open that question up to Rabbi Confer's question first it was your equation now your question um, which is um, has the you know, when we talk about meaningful or useful, can, like if everything is about its connections, um, are you taking a lesson about connection differently now in coronavirus world than otherwise or not? Uh, or, or is it not a binary? I I'll say that I'm having a harder time maintaining grudges, um, which is not the worst thing, but um, there's a paragraph before just my personal answer to your question, but I would love if other people would is uh, there's a paragraph before the nighttime bedtime Shema that I, I didn't, I stopped saying actually, because it reminded me of my grudges and made me upset. And it's Harini, Ani Mochel, everyone, I forgive everyone who did anything wrong to me today. I let it go. Tomorrow's a new day. You wronged me today. Great. That was today. Tomorrow's tomorrow. And at some point, midway through the rabbit, I stopped saying that because I said, you know, I don't want to forgive this person. I don't want to. I don't think it's helpful. It's it's not um, constructive. It does. My therapist says not a good idea to be so for going with that. Whatever. So, you know, and I thought maybe it's a bad paragraph. But now, uh, I'm feeling like, well, you know, you don't get to inhabit the world alone. You share a world with other people. That's it. And whether you like them or not, you could kill them and they could kill you if mm -hmm. you happen to cross each other in the grocery store. So, um, so I don't know if that's a take on this teaching, but that's a very like tangible take, but it's all about connection. That's just it. And it doesn't really matter if I forgive them or not because we've got to collaborate or not. Um, I don't know. Hmm. But if, if anyone else has a response to Rabbi Confer's question. I'm not sure if it's a response to the question, but just continuing with this theme. Connection is, um, you know, another way that manifests itself is in context. So a text only has meaning or rather has different meanings in different contexts, right? So just as you were saying, um, you, you're going to read the text differently in the age of coronavirus than you might read otherwise. And what maybe we're learning here is that's, of course, the right thing to do. It's going to have a new meaning in the context of uh, coronavirus because this text connected to that context reveals one thing, same text connected to a different context will reveal different meanings. Mm. Mm. Which leads to the interesting question, what context, right? And I, I, I supposed it was Christianity and Islam that were the context of the original teaching. Although I don't know if that's true. I don't know when the original Midrash is dated actually. I'll have bet to the Rebbe Akiva and which parts are the Zohar's original take versus not. Um, it's always a tough question. That's an academic question. Uh, anyone else have a different context for reading this? Well, I'm, I'm curious if Bet is then chosen, right, Bereshi, if bet, bet is then chosen because of its interconnectedness. It's guilt by association is positive rather than negative. Mm. I'm jumping ahead, but I kind of want to test this theory. Okay, so we've got the bet hypothesis looming for a double blind controlled study. Uh, <laughs> we'll call it operation first letter, warp speed. So we'll keep that in our minds. I'm not going to say more about it now because we're going to get to bet. But could we do Tzadi? Do you think we'd try one more letter in, for today? Um, although the Tzadi is really, is a, got a lot in it, but some of the letters are really quick towards the end. It's almost as if like in writing the teaching, they really did the first letters a lot and then they kind of like wanted to get to the end. But 
Alat Atsadi Amr. So if you're thinking, gosh, we're never going to get to anything but the alphabet for the next three years, we will, because it goes quickly at the end, more quickly. Alat Atsadi Amr Kamei, Ribon Alma, Nircha Kamach Lemivri Bi Alma, the Ana Bi Chatim in Sadikim, the Ant de It Kriat Sadik Bi Rashim, Dachtiv, Kit Sadik Adunoi, Stakot Ahiv, Ubi Yaut Lemivri Alma, Amrla Sadi, Sadik Ant. Sadik ant it kriat. Aval ant sarich le meve timira. Wait ant sarich lit gaya kokach begin to lo le meve pit chon pella alma. My time on nun ihi acha yud, the shma de vrit kadisha, virachi vala, the itachad, itachid bahada, viraza da kadbra kutsha brichu la adam harishon, du partsufin brao. We begin kach ant with the yud. Mahadr la chora kagavna da chasad siyor v'la it hadru anpin ba anpin kagavna da chasad siyor. It's talking about el kagavna da. It's talking about tata. We have pictures of what it's talking about in the English. The tata kagavna da amar la kucha brichu tuf. The Anna Zamin Lenasra Lach, the Mebadach Apin Ba Apin, Ababa Atra Achra Tistalak, Nafka Mikameva Azlat. So, replied, okay, so the letter Tzadi entered, she said to him, Master of the world, may it please you to create the world by me, for Tzadikim, the righteous, are sealed by me, and you who are called Sadiq, righteous, are signified by me, as it is written, for God is Sadiq, righteous, and then loving righteousness. I hate stakot in Psalms. It says that God is righteous and loves righteousness. So God is the thing and is, uh, loves the, the equality. It is fitting to create the world by me. It will be a righteous world. He replied, Sadi, you are Sadiq. You are, it's funny, this is a pun, because Sadiq, Really, from Tzodek, it doesn't just mean righteous, it means right. <laughs> so it's like, you're right. I should create the world by you, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like this interesting theme of like being true, being but. right, doesn't matter. It's like not worth it. So, but you should remain hidden. Now, they don't actually say this, um, but I think hidden, here they use the word Tamir in the Zohar, hidden, but the Hebrew tsanua might be related, which is also with a tzadi. And I, I wonder if the Zohar, in using the Aramaic of Tamir, hidden doesn't use the Hebrew word tsanua, but has in mind the Hebrew word tsanua, which has this letter in it. Just because the others have, you know what I mean? We've gotten emet and mavet. We've gotten uh, uh, shadai and sheker and kesher. So I wonder if we're still playing these letter games and we're saying tzadi tsanua. You're right, but you should remain hidden but it uses an Aramaic word, Tamir, which doesn't have that letter. So I don't know. Again, this is my um, things I guess when I read. <laughs> I'll leave to others to un unchecked, no, no study. So as to not provide the world a pretext. What do you mean? A pretext for what? How so? She is nun. Yod from the, okay, so we, we have two letters that make up the tzadi. I don't know if you can see this. Can you see my cursor? So we, the tzadi can be described as the letter nun and the letter yud. These two letters, nun, if you imagine this part of the tzadi as a nun and this part as a yud, it's really a combination of these two letters. And nun and yud are the classic masculine and feminine letters in the Kabbalah. Yud as a, um, a, a, a small dot sometimes can be thought to symbolize like a phallus in a certain way, although Vav can, but you can have the masculine element to it. And Nun for Nukva, the Aramaic for a whole, symbolizes the feminine. Um, so here we have these two letters of Yud and Nun. So we immediately go to the story of Adam and Eve. Yud from the name of the Holy Covenant comes and rides on her is united with her. So this now we're dealing with these sort of masculine feminine unities we've been speaking about. Sadiq being right represents this unit. It's a couple. It's a man and a woman in this example. Uh, this is a mystery. When the Blessed Holy One created Adam, he created him with two faces, the words du part sufin. Now, for note, the Ari, when he spoke about du part sufin, 
two faces, spoke about Chochmah and Bina as two parts of Fin. I don't know, as two faces. He often referred to them, them as that. I don't know if that's what we're speaking about here, but created um, an androgynous being, according to the Midrash, with two faces. Not Adam and Eve, but one. Because originally it was one person created, at least according to the first account of creation. First account of creation? Second account of creation. This is the mystery when the, uh, yes, two faces. So the Yod faces backwards, like this. They were not turned face to face, like this. It looked upward, like this. These pictures are distorted in the scan a little bit. Um, and it looked downward, like this. Um, so we have these problems. You see, you have these two um, Nun and Yud, but like, are they facing each other or are they facing away? So in an androgynous being, the two faces are facing away. And this is referred to um, in later mystical literature as the Sod Nisira. So if you're looking to learn more about this subject, you would look up the Sod Nisira, the secret of the removal. So how does an androgynous being that is one being with two faces, come to be two beings. And here we're dealing with the basic question, which we've talked about, of connection or unity a lot, even today. Like how do people that can't see eye to eye, that are one, come to be separate face-to-face -face entities that are able to join with each other? And so here we have two um, like contrapositive things. We've got a unified being that can't see its own parts, or separate beings who have to look each other in the eye and deal with each other, as in the prior letters. Yeah, like I'm thinking of tough, where the righteous didn't rebuke the wicked. Or here, men and women have to get along. Um, so we're back at the men are from Mars, women are from Venus, like Kabbalistic marital therapy. But that's just a, an example of what's going on here. So they're looking all around these two parts. And actually, in different traditions, the Tzadi is written differently. In the Sephardic Torah, the Tzadi is written in a different way than in the Ashkenazic Torah. And some of the things that matter when you look at different Torahs are how do they write the Tzadi? And the Ari had his own way to write the Tzadi. So the Blessed Only One said to her, turn back for I intend to split you and transfigure you face to face, but you will arise elsewhere. She left his presence and departed. I'm gonna see what it says, you will arrive elsewhere. Right, the Yud and the Nun will face one another, not here, but in another letter, Tet. Right, so there's another, another letter like this where they're not facing apart, but facing each other. So here again, we have a um, related to a critique of truth. And maybe I'll ask the question, what's the relationship between this and the prior two teachings? Um, we'll close on that question or anything you're taking from this. But Sadiq being right here is rejected and being righteous is rejected because it leads to um, an impossibility of relationship. Now it is right, there is one unity. And actually one unity is the way that things are. So the teaching's a little deeper. The Tzadi originally facing apart but unified as a whole is right. That's what the world is. We are separate individuals and we primarily relate as that way, but we're really one whole. We just can't see that or see each other. <laughs> really seeing each other would allow us to see that in this example. But once you do the surgery and transfigure face to face, and you can see other people and there's individuality, we're separate. <laughs> and then we have to struggle to relate to each other and get along. And that's harder now in the coronavirus context or easier now, maybe, I don't know. So, um, so, so it's now no longer accurate as a description of the unity of the world, though it is accurate to our, um, fake experience, which by the way, is sometimes called the Olam de Sheker in the Kabbalah, the fake world where we perceive difference that isn't really metaphysically true in an emanative system. So um, there's a relationship between the fake connections um, that we imagine and this, this thing. But the Sod Nisira in Kabbalah is, it bridges on an ethical teaching, which actually did come up in our Musar class. The Musar people speak about it as the, the difficult task of relating to other people with their full dignity. I'm um, seeing them for who they are and not for who you want them to be. Or um, as my 
as Rabbi Jonathan Slater now quoted twice in this class said, um, other people aren't in perfect versions of you. So that, that's always a good uh, rebuke, right? We often judge other people by like, inherently by how we would respond, but not by who they are and how they might respond to a situation. Um, so this is kind of the Sodna Sira. So any comments about this Saadi teaching? Yeah, well, uh, maybe a question. I sort of think all of the basic teaching is you, the phrase is a little up, up to me. It says, God replies to Tzadi, you are you provide the world a pretext. I don't understand that phrase. Like, how is, how, how would using the um, Tzadi to be the first letter give the world a pretext? What exactly does that mean? How does that relate to the teaching as you rendered it? So it says in the, in the Aramaic, that you not give an opening of mouth to the world. So what's the pitchkon pe uh, that we're talking about? That's a good, what is the pitchkon pe? Um, anyone have a thought? I'm thinking. I mean, maybe given the teaching that follows, it would somehow endorse the divisions and individuality that we're trying to overcome by the underlying unity, right? Yeah, so or I would say something like, unity is true, but impossible to perceive. Um, and so, right, because that would be the original posture of the tzaddik, that it is one letter, but it can't see each other in the eye. The yud and the nun can't face to face, as it's, like they're trying in the teaching to see each other and they're stuck because like one side of the head, each side of the head is, they can't see each other because they got the neck in the middle. You know what I'm saying? Like they can't configure it until they're separated. Um, so, um, right. It, it, I guess I would think that it's something like the unity of the world is a given, but it also, you'll never perceive it. In other words, this mystical quest of unity, which you, the Zohar, think everyone should be trying to do, it's impossible. We're not, we, we weren't created that way. Or, or we were created that way, but we'll never perceive it. And so stop trying and just accept that it is and like live our lives of dispute and dis discord. And let's live with, you know, the plain law and forget the mystical uh, desire to be connected for transcendence, I guess would be the word, to transcend one's own existence and to be related to other. So it, does that possible that it would say the Zohar is impossible or, or implausible? Um, and to, how does anyone feel about that? Like maybe you think that's true. <laughs> like I wonder should... if it's, I, I'm kind of focused on Tamira and the kind of the idea of hidden and like, it, like piton pela alma, like like an open mouth forever. Like it, it, it's almost like is it almost saying like it would be, would be like revealing too much. Like the world would know too much, and like there, this is the whole. I, I don't know. Like they, 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 something about like the the point of this is to like struggle through it. If we just had a tzadi, then it would just you know there would be people could just kind of rest on their laurels, and everybody would have the tr you know the sort of the kind of secrets right off the bat, but there's, there's something that needs to remain hidden because the, and now I'm just like kind of uh, uh, editorializing here, but this, there's something about the struggle for the mysticism that's like critical. You can't just like give it away. And there's, maybe I'll say, I think there could be that um, like tzaddikata or tzaddikant, right? You're, you're right. So there's a sense in which God is kind of saying, well, you're right, but this needs to be hidden. In other words, yes, you mystics, you will never achieve ultimate union. You know, we're always going to live in the Kabbalah's Ratzova show of strive towards unity and then return. That's the model that's often, we, we always return to our separate existence or sechel nefrat in the language of the, the rationalist philosophers, right? A, an individual intelligence. So we'll always return to being individual intelligences. Someone mentioned Descartes last time, right? It's gotta be related to the Seich on the fraud idea. Um, so um, we're always gonna go back there and that's always true. And if we are really all connected, we're going to be connected whether we perceive it or not, which is also true, right? So these things are true, that we'll never achieve you know, harmony uh, and 
we'll always be part of a greater whole, even if we're stuck in our individual existences. They're always true. But the purpose isn't right. You know, the, the, the idea of the Zohar is meritorious to try uh, that there's, um, uh, in this case, um, uh, something worthy in the, the effort or the journey, like you were saying, Joe, or the struggle to, um, to achieve unity, even if it's ultimately never going to be the only thing. I was understanding the hidden and the pitchon pair a little bit differently. Yeah, sure. So go ahead. This is just. Uh, it seems to me that, um, and I'm not sure I'm getting all of it, that the the explanation of the tzadi, there's something wrong with the tzadi, the way it's facing, the way it's together and needs to be split. There's something wrong with it. We want to keep it tucked away because if people saw the tzadi, they would get a wrong impression from the tzadi because there's something essentially misunderstood or could be misunderstood about the tzadi. So that's why we want to tuck it away so that it doesn't become the object of misunderstanding. That's what I'm understanding the pitchon pair as a kind of, if it was revealed, it would be misunderstood. Hmm. And again, so I think Rabbi, Com Rabbi Comfer, are you suggesting it would distract people from or distract us from the search for? I think, it, you know, again, I'm not sure I understand it, but it would distract us in understanding togetherness and separateness in a misunderstood way. So better away than misunderstand it and not get the right idea of unity and separation. So, um, so you, you said you have a different understanding, but actually when I heard what you said, I heard the same thing. So I just want to make sure I can understand the difference between, which is actually the lesson of the tzaddi maybe, but I want to make sure I understand the difference between what you're saying and what I was suggesting, because I'm not sure I do. Uh, I agree with you that if the tzaddi were uh, the letter to start the Torah and revealed and not hidden, that it would mislead people in some uh, way, that there's something wrong about the shape of it. Um, my suggestion is that the thing that's wrong about the shape of it is that the Nun and the Yod are not facing each other the way it's written. They're facing up, out. And that would suggest to people that they're part of one letter, i.e. one existence, but they're not facing each other. They struggle to perceive each other uh, in, correctly. There, there's an error in the relationship between, in this case, male and female, but every, the energies of the world. And that there's something true about that, in that that is true. That is a good description of our world. <laughs> One world where people struggle to <laughs> rightly perceive each other. But, but there's something very misleading about it because people might think it has to be that way, that we're, there's no point in trying to overcome our differences because we'll never perceive them. Or it's like people in comparative religion that say that the experience of one religion can never map onto the experience of another religion. Or Soloveitchik said this, that a, a Christian can never know about the Jewish experience of religion because it's, it's sui generis, it's his own thing. And likewise in the reverse. Um, whereas others like Professor Alan Brill would say, no, there's one reality to a religious experience and it may have different cultural language, but in the end they should be transcribable. So um, I, I guess I'm wondering, would you, um, do you agree with that sort of assessment of the tzaddi as, 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 is that, are we getting at, I think, the same problem? Yes, you expressed it. You expressed the problem with the tzaddi better than I understood it, so. No, 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 I am I'm, I'm beating around the bush to try and uh, land at the, the, the problem. So I actually, I think that the Saudi is a, a powerful symbol of problems and solutions here. And, and the problem is so big, mind you, that God needs to do a surgical operation on the Saudi <laughs> and has to cut it apart. Um, and it is better expressed, according to this teaching, in another letter, in the letter Tet, where Tzadi and where Nun and Yud come, uh, come to 
to face each other. So, uh, all right, we'll end with that. I think if anyone has any further comment or reflection, um, we'll pick up next week with the letter pay, if you like. Um, All right. I hope you've enjoyed. This has been another episode of Midweek Mysticism. Is that what we're calling it? And I, I hope you will take, maybe it's a good question to think about and come back with, like, is there anything tangible, you know, so that this isn't floating out there? So the ultimate point is, even in this Saadi teaching, to take, take it and face each other, even if that's not, even if that's not true or real in some fundamental sense, to have some interpersonal application of it like what uh what what is there anything you're taking from this i think there's something about not being the hopelessness of not ever facing so mm. if if there's a hopelessness to it it takes away all the um the energy it kind of deflates and it brings on like a, de a depression and so what you don't want to do is start with hopelessness you want to start with hope. Mm. The Zadi is hopeless. Your, uh, or don't walk around with your mouth open. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Zadi is hopeless, yeah. Uh, and I, I'm thinking very much of Buber's teachings about I and thou, right, in, in, in the context of the Zadi people. Can, we can speak about that too if you want. But yes, uh, let's take Deb's teaching as the conclusion to this. The Zadi is a hopeless letter. It may be accurate, and, and, and we'll call, conclude with this. Pessimists, the Tzadi is a pessimist. And as Marty Seligman has noted, this will be the conclusion of our class, pessimists have more accurate memories of the past. When they ask pessimists, like, what happened 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. They're much more accurate. Optimists have wildly changed accounts of what happened for the better. But they don't, they don't remember how bad it was. Mm -hmm. They think it was better than it was. Pessimists are right. The Tzadi, which stands for Tzodik, right, is right in its pessimism, but it's hopeless. Optimists also have better outcomes in, you know, life because they have a deluded view of things. So this is in some ways maybe a teaching about optimism and pessimism or hopelessness. And the Tzadi is a, an accurate but pessimistic letter. And so God does a surgery to it to turn it into an optimist. Mm -hmm. Learned optimism. And with that, <laughs> and with that we go forward. <laughs> with that, oh, thank good you, week, everyone. Thank, you. thank oh. you so much. Thank you. Thank you.